Hello, everyone. Um, we are waiting for people to join. I think now everyone has joined from the waiting room, but people will drift in uh, as we go along. So let me welcome everyone to this session of the Virtual Seminars in Economic Theory. And today we have a great pleasure of having Jakob Steiner from Serge EI and Zurich, and he'll present Growth and Likelihood. This is a joint work with Larry Samuelson, who is also here with us. And we also have uh, two guest panelists, Yuta Ishii and Colin Stewart. So welcome, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, welcome the audience. B before I, I give floor to Jakob, let me remind you about the format. It's usually one hour presentation. Uh, please feel free to use the chat, but also you can unmute yourself and ask questions live. Um, but there is going to be a dedicated Q&A sessions at the end, 15 minutes after the top of the hour. And after the Q&A sessions, we'll stop the recording. We, we broadcast live and we record. We'll stop the recording and you can stay for a couple of more minutes for informal chats. Uh, next week, we have uh, uh, Lee Yarif from Princeton uh, uh, presenting Disentangling Explorations from Exploitations. This is a joint work with Alessandro Rizzeri and Aran Shamaya and Gaston Get guest panelist is Nicolas Kling. All right, Jakob, the floor is yours. So thanks for having us both. And uh, well, we, we study growth, stochastic growth, and we define it quite generally. For us, it's just a multiplication of random variables. And if you think of growth uh, so generally, uh, then it can have interpretations or applications in seemingly very distinct domains. So in economics, we are interested in the growth of wells, uh, and that is just a multiplication of random returns. Now, in seemingly different domain of statistics, we are interested in the likelihood of a sample. Again, a likelihood of a sample is just a product of the likelihoods of individual random data points. And in both of these cases, we are interested in policies, or in the latter case, in hypotheses that maximize the growth rate uh, of either wells or likelihood of the sample as the time unfolds. And so given a similar mathematical structure in those uh, two cases, it is natural that there are results that apply to both of these domains. Uh, in, in abstract and verbal terms, our main result can be stated as that the optimal policy, that is the one that maximizes the growth rate, seeks some measure of consistency with outcomes it generates. Now that sounds very abstract and it's hard to understand. So, so before I will give you the mathematical version of it, let me translate it to, to the realm of those two domains. So in economics, this exhibits itself as uh, some version of a meritocratic principle, it turns out that policies that redistribute wells and that do it in a way that maximizes the growth rate of an economy, turn out to maximize also some measure of consistency between wealth allocation and the merits of individual people, this of contributions of individual people to the growth rate itself. In the case of predictive coding, which is uh, kind of a uh, discipline in, on the boundary of statistic, machine learning, and cognitive sciences, uh, the main result uh, exhibits itself as some kind of a consistency uh, principle that says that a good way of processing information maximizes consistency between prediction uh, of sensory information and the actual given sensory information a system uh, receives. Uh, now, a very short literature review without any names. Uh, we will have part of the talk which will sound hopefully like a standard economic talk. We'll talk about redistribution of wells, and we will uh, kind of pick up on, on a stylized fact that the redistribution terms may, in some situation, enhance growth of economies, and uh, we will provide uh, perhaps new angle on, on why this might be the case. And now classical explanation is that returns are concave. Uh, and so if you take money from the rich people and give it to the to the poor people, you are reallocating it from, from the low returns to the high returns, and that might be helpful. 
uh, we shut down that channel and in our model instead redistribution of wealth is some form of a hedge against productivity shocks so if the society doesn't quite know who is going to be productive then hedging against productivity shocks might might be helpful uh, we will also within the economic part of the talk relate to current discussions on meritocracy which are in, in economics currently mostly empirical and, and experimental uh, we will be asking which meritocratic uh, uh, principles facilitate growth, and we will be asking, you know, relating to the to the standard questions being discussed on this topic in economics, should initial conditions, should the output of the people or lack in their production somehow influence who will end up enjoying particle wells uh, uh, in, in the society, and we will provide uh, some answers to date in terms of, of maximization of growth. Uh, in terms of methods, we'll be heavily relying on information theory, one can view our model as an extension of uh, Kelly's betting problem, which is a problem of individual investor who would like to optimally hedge against the risk of his portfolio. Uh, we will generalize and extend that and reinterpret uh, that uh, setting. And we will also relate to somewhat to, to machine learning, where in particular in machine learning, uh, uh, it is admitted, unlike in most of economic theory, that Bayesian updating is hard. That this is not an easy task. And uh, so machine learning literature has developed uh, what they call variational methods that uh, deal with Bayes' rule as an outcome of an optimization as opposed to a simple formula. And we will provide some new intuitions or perhaps a new proof to those, to those methods. Uh, so that's the end of the introduction. Uh, for the rest of the talk, uh, the first part uh, will be economics. I will give you a very stylized model of economic growth and redistribution. Uh, within that part, we will uh, we will derive what we call a meritocratic principle and kind of a fairness principle that seems to um, that is uh, a necessary condition for growth maximization. Uh, then the second part will be proof that will be mostly information theory and then introduction on new techniques. And then if time allows, uh, I, will, uh, I will reveal that actually all that we have done uh, can be reinterpreted as a model of predictive coding, which is a model not of, of, of economic growth, but a model of, of cognition. So it's a bit of a surprising connection, but it has to do with the fact that uh, statistical learning is some so, sort of growth as well. Let me now start with a bit of a boring slide on notation. So I'm going to introduce notation that we're going to use throughout the model. Uh, we are in the model going to interpret objects which are not quite probability distributions as if they were probability distributions, and it will be conductive for our analysis. So uh, let me let me kind of give you a hint on. On, on, on the notation we use. So what you see on this slide is just a notation that we use uh, uh, in very very in, in a very standard way for probability distribution. So you can have some probability distribution over X. You can also introduce likelihoods or the conditional probability distribution over Y given X. And these two objects together would then define a joint distribution or marginal distribution over Y so or a conditional distribution when you flip the conditions by the standard formulas. And when we are talking about probability distribution, it is usual that uh, you would use the same letter P to, de to, to, to denote distinct functions, and you would dis differentiate between these distinct functions, say Px and, and the joint distribution, by spelling out the arguments of those functions. So that's what we are going to do, except we are going to allow for the likelihoods not to be normalized. So we will just insist that those are non-negative functions of the two arguments but this won't be distrib probability distribution because they won't add up to one. Nevertheless, we will go on and we will have some probability distribution over X and these positive real functions. And we will uh, derive all these other functions using formally the formulas that you would use if these were probability distributions. And we will think of these as joint distribution, marginal distribution or conditional distribution, except that they will be generalized. These objects won't be normalized. And if it happens that some of those objects happen to be normalized, such as the Q over X will be normalized by assumption and this one by construction, we will just write it in bold uh, to, to help you distinguish what is a true distribution and what is not. And this turns out to be useful for our analysis. It allows us to use some information theory techniques slightly outside of their usual domain. 
So equipped with this, let me give you an economic model. So it's going to be a model of, of redistribution and growth. So there will be a set, finite set of individuals. Uh, time will be discrete. And uh, the, the main object of interest is what we call an allocation or a sharing rule, which formally is a probability distribution over the set of individuals. And an economic interpretation of it is, is that it specifies the share of aggregate wells each individual I receive at the beginning of each period. So at the evening of a period, a virtual social planner is going to confiscate all the wells. And in the, in the morning of the next period is gonna give uh, uh, shares uh, that depend on the individuals to the people according to a stationary allocation. So maybe max is very important. So it's entitled to two thirds of the allocation. I will get uh, one over 10, Angel will get uh, two over 10, etc. Altogether, this should sum up to one. We will also, once we will get these wells in the morning, uh, we will enjoy some gross returns on the wells that we have been given. Uh, these returns are heterogeneous. So maybe max is more productive or uh, maybe, also, there is an element of luck. So these returns will also depend on some aggregate random state, omega t, which is drawn id from some uh, probability distribution that I will refer to as a prior. So this is a shock distribution. And so the wealth of each individual is multiplied by his gross return. And that determines, together with the morning allocation, the aggregate wealth the society has in the evening. And the planner is going to choose this allocation to maximize the long run growth rate of this economy, which is spelled out uh, in the optimization problem here. So here the allocation is chosen from subset Q, which is a set of feasible allocation. So it could be that Max is entitled to the two thirds of, of, of share and he cannot get less, or maybe the, the, the planner cannot make the allocation to unequal or or maybe it has to be too, uh, uh, unequal, whatever is this set of feasible allocation rules the planner is choosing from them. And now let me walk you through the objective. So let's look first into, into the brackets. So Mr. I gets this much of wells in the morning, or that's the share of the wells. Then in the, on the day in which the shock is omega, this is the re gross return of Mr. I. So this is by how much her morning wells is multiplied. Now, when you sum it up across people, then this is the aggregate wells at the end of the period in which the shock was omega. If you apply logarithm to that, then you got a growth rate on that given day. And since omega is random, you also take an expectation with respect to those shocks, uh, which, are, uh, which are drawn from this distribution P0 or some objective prior distribution. Now, let me apologize for changing notation after I have introduced it. So I have introduced this return to the R because that would be, that's what the natural economists would choose naturally for this object. But I'm actually gonna rename it. I'm gonna call it a Q of omega I as if it was some kind of a conditional distribution. It is not because it's just a, a, a positive real valued function of two inputs. Uh, but I'm going to interpret it as if it was kind of a generalized likelihood or conditional distribution. And together with Q allocation, I will, I will treat this as if it was a, a generalized uh, uh, distribution from my previous slide. And let me just give you a hint that this may pay off. So if I call returns by this Q and, and treat it formally as a conditional distribution, then what I have here, QI times this is formally my joint distribution, generalized. Then I'm summing up over i's. So that is formally a marginal distribution. And so the formula for the social planner has, has simplified at least aesthetically into something simpler. Of course, there will be more benefit for using this notation uh, later, no, uh, later on. Uh, but uh, if you have clarifying questions to, to the model and, and notation, then this is a good time to ask because that's what the model is and now i'm gonna gonna solve it and so there's there there's no discounting here nothing like that it's a maximization of long run growth rate yes yes not, yes, not yes. The... so we, we don't need discounting uh, indeed and so here you've got uh, there's no relationship between the choice of allocation and the returns Yes, so so the, correct. Uh, so this is a simplified version of the model. In the paper, we allow for the possibility that the choice of allocation 
uh, the, the, the planner can influence the returns as well. And maybe uh, there are some joint constraints on the allocation return. So it might be that you are redistributing a lot, then you are kind of messing up with incentives, people will work less, and that will affect the return function. We allow for that in the paper, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to keep for throughout the talk the returns exogenous and fixed, and I'm going to uh, to allow the planner to, to, to mess only with the allocation, but actually uh, the extension, I mean, the model works quite well if, if, if you can influence both. Thank you. That's Sorry, so just in terms I, of in terms of real world economics. So this is like non distortionary taxation that you have in mind here, and in the paper you you're allowing for exactly safety. exactly. So so in this case, uh, I'm, I mean this particle version is is uh, is abstracting away from any incentive effects of the redistributions on on the on the returns that is on the productivities of those agents, which is of course unrealistic, and that's why in the paper we allow for for a joint optimization across allocations and returns, and we allow for the possibility that the choice of, of, of allocation affects the feasible returns, uh, but it, it complicates notation. It's just a notational complication, not, uh, not, not a, a, a true complication of, of the model. All right, so and, thanks for- uh, I had one more question, sorry. Um, so it's the- the fact that you're allocating in a stationary way, I think you'd said this in the paper, uh, suppose suppose you could do something history dependent, does that? Very good, thank you. Great yeah. question. So if these states, omega, are RID, then we can show that uh, this stationarity is without loss, that you would want to do choose a stationary policy. If the states were not ID, so suppose there were serial correlations, then there would be good reason to use non-stationary policies. So suppose you are productive today. Well, if there is a serial correlation, you are likely to be productive tomorrow, in which case I may want to leave a lot of wells with you uh, today. And so you would have more complicated uh, you know, policies. Markovian policies would, would be optimal again if, if, the, if the process of the state would be Markovian, but we don't do that in, 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 in the talk nor in the paper. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for the clarifying questions. Uh, here is an example. So this is just a very standard example. I will go beyond that example. Uh, I'm just going to clarify that what we are doing encompasses uh, the problem of calibrating. So uh, suppose that in each period, everybody except one random player will go bust, the, the wells will disappear and just the wells of one person will survive and let the, the state determine which is the surviving agent. So, so Omega is gonna be living in the, in the set of players. It's gonna be a distribution over the set of players taken from the distribution and just clarifies which person survives uh, today or which person's wealth survives. So that formally means that the return is, is a delta function. Uh, your wealth will survive if you are the lucky guy today. And let's assume that the planner is unconstrained in the allocation, that is she can choose any distribution of, of wealth across agents without further restrictions. And in that case, uh, this is just equivalent to Kelly's betting, where each individual is an asset and uh, you are trying to maximize the, the, the growth rate of, of your wells. And an optimal allocation is proportional uh, to the, or is equal to the probability of each agent's well surviving. So if Colin's well survives with a high probability, I will give him a high share of wealth but I will not give him all the wells because giving all the wells to, to the guy who survives with the highest probability would lead us to, 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 to being bust uh, for sure in the long run. And so you want to smooth it out by, by having this kind of hedging policy. So this is well known. This is just an example. And now I'm one slide away from the main result, which the main result will say that will be a necessary condition on an optimal allocation. And will, it will say that the optimal allocation, except of maximizing the wells, also is in some sense most fair because it, it uh, aligns the, 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 the wells allocation with some kind of, of a merit measure. So to formulate that, I need to define a measure of merit, and this is what this slide does. So I'm going to define a merit distribution, uh, which as the, as the 
as the name suggests, it's going to be some kind of a measure. It says how much each agent is useful in, in producing economic growth. So first, let me de define it for, for a given shock omega, it is given realization of the state. So take a period in which the realization of the state is given by omega. And let's ask how much of the aggregate wells has been produced by an individual high? Like what share of aggregate wells this guy has produced? So that's given by this fraction. So this is how much of wells person I got in the morning. Then she has enjoyed this growth rate in this state omega. So this is her evening wells. And the denominator is the sum of the evening wells of everybody in the society. So the fraction is the share of I wells. And formally, this also is just a conditional distribution of I given omega if I would be treating this, uh, this object Q as, as, as a generalized distribution. And so that was for a given shock realization and shocks are random. So I'm gonna define the merit distribution as, as the average of this object across uh, all shocks omega. So I'm just gonna take an expectation over omega with respect to the true distribution and that is defined, uh, that defines the merit distribution. So it's a distribution which has the following verbal interpretation. At a random day, I pick a dollar in the evening and I ask who has produced the dollar. And with some probability it was Colin, with some probability it was Max, and those probabilities would be the merits of, of, of those individuals. Okay? So it is dependent on the allocation because the allocation enters the definition of merit distribution. So here is the main result. It says that the gross maximizing allocation also minimizes some measure of wedge, a kullback liber divergence from the induced merit. So you take this gross maximizing allocation Q star, you compute the merit distribution under this policy, and then you ask what would be the most fair allocation in terms of being most aligned with these merits that we've got under the policy that we are using. You examine all the feasible policies, and it turns out that the one closest to the merit distribution is the gross maximizing allocation, is the one which is being used. So recall, recall here that KL divergence is some kind of a pseudo distance between two distributions. You, you plug in two distributions, it returns a real number, and you can think of that as a pseudo distance between those two. So the, 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 op, the gross maximizing allocation is a fixed point, which is, is, is most fair given uh, the, 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 the merit distribution it produces. I'm gonna illustrate the, the, the result on an example, and then later on, I'm gonna prove it. Uh, so questions- Can, I, can, I, ask, can I ask one question? So uh, the fixed point here is not necessarily unique, right? Um, so there could Very be good. multiple. Very good. And, yeah. yeah, so there is a, there is there might be trivial fixed points, such as if we give all the wells to Max in the morning, uh, then Max has a merit of one because he's producing everything that is to be seen in the evening. And so then giving all the wells to Max is indeed the most fair thing under our uh, terminology. So that would be a trivial and, and perhaps not a very appealing uh, fixed point. So indeed, this is a necessary, not a sufficient condition. Uh, in the paper, we also have sufficient conditions. I won't speak very much about them, but I will mention later on that if you start with any interior allocation and you apply myopically this principle iteratively, this will lead to a fixed point which happens to correspond to, to, to the actual gross maximizing. But well spotted, this is there is a multiplicity and this is a necessary, not a sufficient condition. All right, here is an example. So just for this. Sorry, Jack, yes. another question. I mean, you can put this off maybe if you're going to talk about this, but. Um... So the Q star here is fixed when you're varying Q. I mean, you kind of make a big deal about this in the paper. Um, are you going to talk about this later? Or yes, like, yes, okay. I, will, I, will, I, will, I will, I will, example will illustrate, I will, yes, I will talk about it. I will, I will mention when I will be talking about it very soon. So here is an example, uh, uh, be there no uncertainty just for simplicity. So omega is formally a singleton. Be there five individuals just to economize the notation that the return of, of Mr. I, B, I. So Mr. Five is very productive. Mr. One is not too productive. So if feasibly, the planner would give everything to Mr. Five, 
uh, but let's impose an inequality constraint. So here, the inequality constraint says that the entropy of the allocation has to be large enough, just means that the allocation has to be uniform enough. Uh, this coincides with one of the indices being used in practice, the deal index, uh, and it's, it's tractable. So if you, if you solve for a gross optimal allocation, it's going to give some share of wealth to everybody, even to the very unproductive Mr. One, who's going to get a mini school wealth share, and Mr. Five is going to get a lot. Then, given that gross optimal allocation, you can ask, what is the merit distribution? You could compute that, and it's going to be some steeper distribution, because Mr. Five not only is very productive, but is also getting a lot of wells in the morning so this is going to be a bit of a more unequal distribution this merit distribution and then you could ask okay so if these are the the, the measures of merit uh, what would be the most fair allocation in terms of, of being most aligned with this distribution and you cannot choose an allocation equal to the merit distribution because that's not feasible this is too unequal but you can ask out of those feasible ones which one is the closest you would find that that would be the blue allocation. And it turns out that this blue allocation is the one that with which you have started, is the one that maximizes the growth rate. So that's what the result says. And I think now I'm getting to Colin's question. We call the principle naive. And what we mean is that the, the, the planner does not minimize the wedge between the 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 merit and allocation. And that is to be seen in this formula where, where a star is in the merit distribution, meaning that this merit distribution is treated as fixed. It's always evaluated according to the gross maximizing allocation. And so this, this, this kind of fairness optimization when you are varying the allocation does not take into account that if you do change an allocation, then the, the actual merit would have changed as well. So if you would have removed the star from the optimization, that if the planner would understand that by changing the allocation, the merit distribution is changing as well, the planner could further decrease this wedge between the merit and allocation, but that would not maximize the growth. So, so it's naive in the sense that there is this myopia in the optimization, but in terms of the growth maximization, that's the correct version of the principle. Now, accidentally, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a nice experimental paper by Peter Andre from, from, from Bonn, who asks people how they would like to redistribute wells based on observing people's effort and then their initial condition. And Peter kind of complains in his paper that, that, that the observed meritocratic attitudes are shallow in that people understand the differences in initial conditions and their implications to, to, to the choices by those agents, but do not account for those in their meritocratic redistributions. And so something similar is kind of happening in our principle, but it turns out that it's optimal in the terms of, of being compatible with maximizing growth. I think we had a question, we had a raised hand. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So I, uh, I Francesco, so I, I was just wondering if maybe this helps me understand, just going back to your example, what the naivety really means it's that you you said at the beginning the you know it would be best to give it all to five in terms of productivity right we, we, we that, that that would be so but here you're already when you're doing the red thing which i think is the dmq star you're already taking the inequality constraint into account to some extent and so that's the that's the MQ star. You see what I mean? You're 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 applying the constraint at that point because I was wondering if you had no constraint whatsoever, what would be what would be the solution to this naive problem? Yes. Okay. So th that's a good question, and the, the the constraints are interesting for us because if there is no constraint, let me let me show you the the principle again, and let me let us figure out what happens if there is no constraint. So the principle wants the allocation to be as close as possible as the merit induced by the gross optimizing uh, allocation. Now, if there is no constraint on the allocation, then you can always match this. And so without a constraint, this will be always perfectly matched. So if there is no constraint on, on, on allocation, it will be always the case that the allocation will be exactly equal to the merit principle. 
And that is important in some applications that we do, and perhaps I will not have time to do it. But if there is not, if there are additional constraints, then this uh, this this meritocratic exercise won't be fully satisfied. You won't be able to 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 achieve the exact equality of merits and the allocation, and then you get some second best uh, uh, outcomes. Right, but I still don't understand why you wouldn't. I mean, remove all the constraints. Uh, this is a deterministic model. You should you should give it all to individual five, right? Isn't that uh, in in the, yes? So if you remove all the constraints and if there is no uncertainty, then indeed you would give everything to individual five or generally to the most productive person. Uh, the reasons why you might not want to do that is that maybe there is uncertainty, in which case you want to have right, 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 right. Uh, and even other reason is that there might be constraints. It might not be feasible to give it to the most. So, so I guess my point is that MQ star is already constrained. You're not looking it's, it's at something, the MQ star is the merit distribution, which summarizes the contribution of the growth of all individuals in the society uh, under the policy, which is most conductive to the, to the world, to the growth. Right, but but applying the constraint to begin yes. with, because the yes. otherwise, right? Yes. So, but now, because I was just thinking, you could think of the one that is unconstrained, and then apply the constraint in terms of the allocation. The, the, the you see what I mean? You could right. So the I other mean, way around. It, it took us quite a while to find this one. It's not like that we thought this is the most fair thing to do, because also it, it's it's not terribly fair thing to do because it, it rewards also people who got a lot of endowment, a lot of allocation at the beginning just by under the optimal solution. So it's it's perhaps not something terribly morally appealing. It is a necessary condition satisfied by by this by the policy that maximizes the growth. Okay. So there are other versions of this that you could consider but they won't be compatible with the growth maximization. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good discussion. Thank you. So, sorry, can I just come back now to my question? Um, I mean, I guess I think I understand mathematically what this naivete thing is doing. Um, but in, in practice, if I were to compare this to a principle where I, I vary Q star, I just make it Q. Um, is there anything you can say about what difference that would make? I mean, does this tend to favor more equality or something uh, or less? Uh, so we have numerically computed that in, in the in the example that I was just giving you is those five guys. And it, it led to a pretty unappealing, uh, unappealing allocation. So I, I, I we, we didn't further investigate it in it because it's it's just not I mean, so we were interested in, in the gross maximization and this is uh, the condition that describes it and we would like to understand why it describes it uh, and the one the version that that endogenizes the merit uh, is not compatible with the gross maximization so we kind of stop examining it all right so for the proof so uh First, I, let me unpack kullback liber divergence because it's going to show up a lot. So kullback liber divergence is a, is, is a map that takes in two probability distributions and spits out a positive or non-negative real number. It's some kind of a pseudo distance. It's pseudo because it's not symmetric. For our purposes, we want to allow for one of the arguments to be a generalized distribution and non-normalized distribution. So we just extend the kullback liber divergence to allow for the latter argument to be a, a, a vector of positive reals and apply the same formula. Uh, it turns out that with this small generalization, the the meaning of kullback liber divergence is a measure of consistency between two objects uh, survives. So you can ask, given some generalized distribution Q, what is the most consistent distribution P with Q? And it, if, if Q was a distribution, then it would be Q itself. If Q is not normalized, then the most consistent distribution with Q is just the normalization of Q. So we are going to, to think of kullback liber divergence as some kind of a measure of consistency between two objects. Now, equipped with this, let me give you the main technical result of the paper which characterizes the, 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 the gross optimal policy allocation in an auxiliary optimization problem, which is bigger in that it involves some additional auxiliary control, uh, where this auxiliary control is a joint distribution on over the pairs of individuals and states. 
And the objective function is, uh, is, is this measure of consistency between these two pairs of joint distributions, where the latter one is uh, given by the allocation and the return. So if you multiply allocation with returns, you get this generalized distribution. This is a policy induced by, by the allocation Q. So now you are choosing these two joint distributions under the constraint. So first, the allocation has to be feasible. And this auxiliary object, when normalized across the states, has to coincide with the prior. And if you do this kind of consistency exercise, then it spits out the gross maximizing uh, uh, allocation and the other object, the optimizer with respect to P, uh, if you marginalize it across states, will give you the merit distribution as I have defined it uh, uh, in, in economic, this economic motivation before. So this is a technical uh, definition of it. And so for the next part of the talk, I would want to unpack this characterization. So at this point, it's absolutely not clear what this auxiliary control is about and why consistency optimization somehow pops out as being something that, that has to do with, with the growth optimization. So I want to slowly go over the theorem and, 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 and give you an intuition for the objects. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to do something simpler. I'm just going to give now just a, a piece of math, and I'm going to prove this simple piece of math, and then I'm going to be a bit more verbal over the, the, the rest of the argument. Uh, so here is a simple piece of math, kind of a simplified version of the result on the previous slide. Take any uh, non-negative function from a finite set to positive reals, and be interested in the sum of this function. So you are summing over x, and you are taking a logarithm. And so it's a logarithm of a sum. And I'm saying that you can characterize the logarithm of a sum as an outcome of a consistency exercise. You take this Q, you think of it as of a generalized distribution, and then you choose over all possible true distributions on a simplex of x, and you are minimizing the kubik leiber batch. And when you find the minimizer, then, then you found the, the object of your interest. So it looks strange, and I would like to give you an intuition for this. So I'm going to prove this uh, in some details. And the, 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 obj the, the objective of, of leading you through the proof is to give some intuition what this optimizer is, this, this distribution over that you control in this problem, and why a consistent distribution with Q has to do something with, with this logarithm. So, that's, so, so let's, let's go over the proof. All right, so what am I interested in? I'm interested in the logarithm of a sum, and I'm going to express it as a growth rate of a process that I'm going to set up. So I just take this sum, and I will be keep on multiplying it, or taking a power of t. And this is going to be a process that I will denote here by yt. And then logarithm of this sum is just the growth rate of this process. All right, so now I'm interested in this process and I would like to understand what is yt for some value of t. So here I have a sum and I have multiplied it t times. So now just with high school mathematics, I can expand this multiplication of brackets and I can express yt as a sum over all sequences of length t, length t, where I'm sequences, the realization of x1, x1 up to xt where I then go over the sequence, evaluate QT at each element of the sequence and keep on multiplying. Okay. Now, notice that once you do that, then each summand is this, this product is, is independent of the permutation of the sequence. So only thing that matters for the value of the summand is the empirical frequency of the realizations of those axes in the sequence. The permutation doesn't really affect the summand. So that means that I can pool all the sequences with the same empirical frequency and it, they, they, they will contribute in the same way to my summation. So let's do that. But when I do that, I have to uh, also keep track of how many sequences with a particle empirical distribution of a given length there exist, because there is going to be a large difference. So imagine, suppose these are head and tails, so X is head or a tail, and take an empirical distribution which gives all the weights to the head. Well, there is just one such sequence, but uh, the 50-50 distribution would have 2 power 2 to t sequences. So there is a big difference between the number of sequences. It depends on, on the empirical distribution. And uh, it is well approximated by 
the, the this exponential function by the exponential expression, the, the number of sequences with an empirical distribution P grows with the lengths exponentially with the rate equal to the entropy of P. So with that, I can express my, my process Yt as a sum over all empirical distributions, but the first part is just the, the sum alongside a sequence with that empirical distribution multiplied by the number of sequences given with, with that empirical distribution. And then there is a, there is a messy algebraic part that I'm going to skip. You can rewrite this as this nice function where you are summing up across empirical distributions. And then the contribution of each empirical distribution is an exponential function of time with the rate equal to the kullback library divergence between that empirical distribution and Q. So what I have done is I have rewritten my gross process Yt as a sum of many processes, one for each empirical distribution. Uh, and they grow, those sub-processes, they grow at different rates where those rates are equal to the, the, the measure of consistency between that empirical distribution and the target Q. And when you are summing up exponential functions, then ultimately, uh, asymptotically, you can forget all of them except the one with the highest exponent. So that's what I do here. I just find which of these two things, these, these, uh, these subgrowth processes have the highest growth rate. It's the one given by the P that is most consistent with Q. And so the, the growth rate is, is, is simplifies to this. And now what I was doing, I was wanted to have a, I, I said that the object of my interest is equal to the growth rate of this process. And I found the growth rate of this process to be given by this minimizer. And this is exactly what was claimed by the lemma. So this was very technical, I think, or I would be lost if I was in the audience. So let me just debrief this verbally, this proof. So. Uh, let me let me go through a Q and A on, on on the proof. So, what are these distributions that the lemma optimizes over? Well, each that distribution uh, corresponds to an empirical distribution of some sequence of realizations. We have expressed the process of, the, of interest as a sum of smaller growth processes, one for each such empirical distribution, and the one which is the fastest dominates all the others. Now, the second question is, why is it that the empirical distribution, which is consistent with Q, grows fast, or grows fast, most um, the fastest of, of all empirical distribution? So if you want to achieve a high growth rate over a sequence, there are two things that you should do. You should concentrate the empirical this, this distribution on those value of X in which this QX is high. You might be tempted even to put all the mass on the maximizer of Q. But if you do that, then you would get a very deterministic distribution. And there are not too many sequences that, uh, associated with that distribution. So you also want to have the distribution to be close to uniform to keep the number of the sequences with that distribution large. And an optimal compromise between those conflicting uh, uh, objectives is to find to choose p star, which is proportional to the q. So it puts a lot of weight on x that that leads to high q, but it's it's it doesn't overdo it. It has uh, some form of, of 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 randomness. All right. So now, so what did you do? I have proven this lemma, and then my 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 bigger result, this the indirect characterization of the growth rate, is just an application of the lemma because the growth rate, if you recall it was 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 this expression where the outer sum is just an expectation with respect to the state and then the the blue lab part is the growth rate in a, in a state omega and that was given by the, the the sum of wells of all individuals mathematically what i want to emphasize here is that i have a logarithm of a sum here and now i have a great lemma for translating logarithm of a sum into some consistency maximization and so if you apply the lemma and then clear things out you get uh, our indirect characterization. Now let me turn a bit more verbal and let me try to give. So let me let me flag out the, the this 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 main technical result. And my next task is is to give some 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 uh, interpretation verbal interpretation to this auxiliary control pi omega. So it's some it's a joint distribution with some constraint, but let, let let's give it an interpretation. 
So for that purpose, let me let me introduce dynasties of dollars. So let's position ourselves to the beginning of the growth process. There is a continuum of dollars, original wealth of this population. And I'm going to think of each dollar in that continuum as starting a dynasty of dollars. So this dollar is going to move around this economy because of redistribution is reallocating dollars across people. So sometimes it's going to spend time with Colin, sometimes with Yukta, sometimes with Francesco. And it's going to multiply. You can think because these people are productive, they have returns. So when it is in the hands of Colin and Colin has a good day, you can think of the dollar as having offsprings. So this dollar multiplies, it has kids, and these kids have kids, so it is a dynasty. And I'm going to think of this dynasty as moving together, always together. All the kids and grandkids move in a pack. Uh, it's just an infinitesimal part of the wealth, so I can do that. And uh, I'm going to define a path of the dynasty for a given time horizon, so think of it as some finite large time horizon, as an empirical frequency with which this dynasty has spent time in the hands of Mr. I and in the state of Omega. Uh, the law of large number says that ultimately for large time horizons, uh, these, these paths will coincide with the prior distribution over the states on the margin. But because there is a continuum of the dynasty, some of these dynasties might be very lucky because Colin is very productive. It might be that there will be some lucky dynasties that will end up in the Colin's hands more often than the used allocation policy suggests just by an accident. Or it might be the case that some dynasties will be lucky in that they will end up in the hands of the individuals at those days when those individuals will be productive and will not end up very often in the hands of those individuals when they will have bad days. So there might just by some luck, there will be some, 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 uh, some, some measures of dynasties that will have some lucky correlation between the, the individuals and the states, or they may deviate from the allocation just again by luck. So all these paths, subject to the coinciding with the prior distribution of the states on the margin, they coincide, they are dynasties following those paths for a particle finite time horizon. And it turns out that the wealth of all the dynasties with a particle pass grows at the rate which is given uh, by, 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 by the, this consistency measure between the dynasty and the policy. So that summarizes both the productivities of these people, the chances that the dynasty have such a lucky pattern of, of, uh, of, uh, of circulation across the economy. It's, it's just a good summary statistic that tells you the growth rates uh, of this path. Now, this path is, so the, the, the aggregate wealth of the economy is just the sum of the wealth of all the dynasties as you're summing up because this path is, but again, you are summing up across uh, exponential processes and the one with the largest exponent wins that dominates all the other uh, sub-processes. And so that gives you this result saying that the, the, the growth rate of the economy is given by a joint optimization or so first fix the policy, then the growth rate is, is uh, given by the most successful path. That's the one that minimizes this. And then also policy is being optimized. So it's a joint uh, uh, optimization where both policy and this path of money, if you want, pattern of circulation in the economy is being optimized. So Yukta is nodding. Thanks for that. That's always <laughs> supporting. Uh, all right, so now I'm close to, to, to wrapping up the proof of the result. So uh, since the, the, the growth of this economy is given by this joint optimization, where you optimize both with respect to the policy and this path of circulation of the money, it also must be the case that the optimal policy is, is optimal against the optimized path. So you first optimize the path, it turns out that the optimal path is 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 uh, equivalent to the merit distribution. I mean, this is something that I'm I'm gonna skip the details of it. It's something that you want to 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 to, to believe me. But the, this this path, given a policy, the optimal path reproduces the the, the merit distribution, which. I guess uh, at this point I have to skip to 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 have time for other things. But then once you have that. 
uh, you can also unpack this optimization. So here I have a Kruber Gleiber divergence of two joint distributions, and there is a standard result uh, called chain rule that tells you that if you have a Kruber Gleiber divergence of two joint distributions, you can separate it into the Kruber Gleiber divergence of the marginal distributions plus a sum of Kruber Gleiber divergence of conditional distributions. Now, this conditional distribution here are in gray because they are not being controlled. So these are the returns which are fixed here. Uh, and so the only optimization that, that is left here is the highlighted part. And this is exactly uh, then uh, the optimization that we got in the merit principle. So it, it, the, the merit principle is a consequence, is a corollary of this more general characterization of the growth rate. All right, so this is all I have from, from, from the proof. And now let me go back. So, so if I have a bit more time, I want to tell you something about the learning process, which shows, which leads to an optimal policy. And I want to give you a connection to, to, to predictive coding. So, so the learning result is to some extent uh, a, a response to Juchta's comment uh, from, from beginning. So, so there might be multiple fixed points uh, that that some of them do not correspond to the growth or maximization policy. But here is a particle selection device. Start with an arbitrary interior allocation, so it gives some share of the wells to everybody. Compute merit, given that allocation, and then update the allocation to the most fair allocation, to the, to the one which is closest to this merit distribution, naively, myopically. This, of course, changes the merit distribution, so recompute it find a new most uh, fair allocation, again, in this naive, myopic manner, and keep on iterating this, uh, this is going to converge to the optimal policy. And this is a consequence of a more general result from, from uh, information geometry that, that applies to this case. All right. So let me let me try to finish. How much, of more, how much time do I have left? Uh, about 10 minutes. Okay, so sounds sounds perfect. So I'm gonna give you. Can I can I ask one follow up question to that? Yes. Um, yes. So does this mean that uh, the only uh, fixed point of that uh, the merit principle, um, the only the the interior um, merit distributions that satisfy that fixed point is unique? Is, 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 is this yes. Yeah, so so saying? if you can find an interior fixed point, then you found the gross optimization. Okay. No, so okay, so so there are, there might be multiple fixed points. So it's not yes, so there might be multiple fixed points, but all but one are gonna not be interior. There is all gonna be only one in okay. generically. So there might be some pathological cases when there are many indifferences, but uh, generically uh there should be a unique uh, interior point, and that's the one that, that if you do find an interior fixed point, you found the, the, the gross maximizing policy. Sometimes a gross maximizing policy need not to be interior, though. Okay. I see. Okay. But again, if you start from interior, then this process will lead you to the, to the edge of the simplex in that case. And then in general, you do generically, you're saying have a unique solution, I mean, a unique growth maximizing policy. That's Generically. Again, I think this would be very similar to, to say, rational attention, where the, the stochastic optimal stochastic choice rule would be generically optimal. But then if you throw in many differences, then, then yes, there will be multiple. Uh, all right, predictive coding. So let me let me perhaps start with something uh, something gentle. I'm going to reinterpret the, the famous result of Berg and White, which are results on asymptotic outcome of either maximum likelihood estimation or, or Bayesian estimation uh, in terms of growth rate. So uh, the standard problem of a statistician uh, concerns with a sample of, of, of signals drawn from some signal generating distribution. And the statistician is choosing among hypotheses where each hypothesis is a distribution and would like to choose a hypothesis that kind of fits the data the best or maximizes the likelihood of the observed sample. Now, just with pretty simple algebra, you can find that the, the, the long run growth rate of the likelihood of a sample generated from the true distribution P evaluated under the hypothesis X, the growth rate is given by this expression 
where the, the gray expression doesn't depend on the hypothesis. So if we're maximizing this, that doesn't matter. And so the, the, the growth rate of the hypothesis that, that is most consistent with P is, is going to be the maximal one. And so you can, you, we know from Berg and White that the statistician will converge to the hypothesis that minimizes the kullback liber wedge from the true data generating distribution. And you can think of that as of the hypothesis that, that maximizes the growth rate of the sample. So this is just a connection of, of statistics and, and the growth processes that, that we had. And let me now complicate this, this, this statistical story with, with hidden states. So I'm now going to uh, uh, introduce you the problem of predictive coding, the, the problem from the, the kind of boundary between the cognitive sciences and, and machine learning and, and statistics. So, so these guys, they consider a system, a biological system, brain, or an artificial system, which samples a signal from some signal generating process. But the system is not particularly interested in the signal. Instead, it would like to form a belief about a correlate of the signal called here a cause. So cause is just a, another random variable correlated with the signal omega. Uh, the system doesn't know the joint distribution. If it knew the joint distribution, then it would apply Bayesian updating. But the system knows the likelihood function. So for every cause i, it knows the conditional distribution of the signals. Uh, doesn't know the prior, though, but it entertains a set of priors uh, that it deems possible. And the system is going to choose a prior or learn a prior by sampling those signals many times. Uh, which we will call a best fit. It's an outcome of this optimization. It's just a prior that if you then compute the marginal distribution of the signal is most consistent with the true distribution of the signal. So it minimizes the kullback liber divergence between the conjectured distribution of the observables and the true distribution of the observables. Now, this can be justified by wide or Berg asymptotic results of learning. So you can think of this guy or system being Bayesian or maximum likelihood estimation, and then each prior over the causes is just a hypothesis. Or as the machine learning literature justifies it, the, the system doesn't like to be surprised, and, and this objective is some measure of ex ante surprise. Uh, and then once the, the, the system found the, the prior, learned the prior, it can, can, uh, it can apply Bayesian updating. Except that this literature says this is not tractable. This is not uh, uh, numerically doable if the, if, the, if the number of signals is large and number of causes is large. And so instead what they propose is a distinct procedure, seemingly distinct procedure, which actually implements uh, the, the desideratum from the previous slide. So this literature talks about the generative model, which is a system's internal model of the world. It's a joint distribution of, of causes and, and signals, the one that I have introduced on the previous slide. But then they add a distinct model called a recognition model, which is again a joint distribution of the causes and, and signals uh, with a constraint uh, that I'm gonna justify. Uh, and introduce. So the recognition model is, is the system interpretation of this, captures the system's interpretation of the signal. So upon observing a signal omega, the system can form an arbitrary belief about the cause, but those signals are sampled from the objective distribution. And so if you are sampling long uh, for a long time enough, uh, then the, the, the experience distribution of the signals will be the true objective distribution. So the recognition model is constrained to coincide with the prior distribution of the signals on the margin, but otherwise these conditional distributions are arbitrary, so it's an arbitrary joint distribution that coincides with the true signal distribution on the margin. Now these generative and recognition models can differ, and generically they do differ, but in a sense to be clarified on the next slide, a good pair of this model is as consistent as possible. So here's the, 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 the result from uh, from, from predictive coding, the best fit, that is the, the prior that explains the signal data the best, is also be given by the, the, the this, this solution of this problem. When you are looking for two models, the, the, uh, the generative model and the recognition models, you are trying to make them as consistent as possible in, by minimizing their kullback liber divergence, subject to the two constraints, that is that they the, the recognition model coincides with the prior on the margin and the, 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 
the prior over the causes in the generative model is feasible. Uh, now, if you look at this, this is exactly our result from the gross. So in the gross, we had this result which featured some path of money and the policies, redistribution policies, uh, but uh, it turns out that the same result uh, shows up in, in, in machine learning. And let me, let me give you a hint of why you would get the, the, the mathematical equivalent between those two seemingly distinct problems. Well, in both cases, uh, we are dealing with an optimization of a growth rate of a multiplicative random processes. So in the case of economics, we were looking into policies that, that maximize the growth rate of aggregate wealth. And what was it? We were thinking of the allocation of agents and the, the returns of those agents were, were determining the, the return, aggregate return in each period. And then we were just taking products of those aggregate returns over periods. In the case of predictive coding, we were trying to maximize the, the, the likelihood of, of a sample of signals, where the likelihood of a sample of a particle signal of a day of, on a given day is given by the prior belief over the causes and the conditional signal distribution given each cause. And uh, you keep on multiplying it as you are expanding the sample. But this is ostensibly written in a way that these two formulas are just the same formulas. And so indeed the two problems are the same. So uh, what we have called an allocation return turns out to be a generative model in the predictive coding. And what we have called a path turns out yeah, to be- We can see the last, the last line on the slide. You cannot see it. Ah, I'm very sorry for that. Uh, uh, right. So I don't know how to, to resolve that. Uh, so we have, it on, we have it in the slides online. Uh, anyway, so, so uh, all right. Yes. So, so what I think at this point, what I want to convey is that the objects between those two interpretations can be perfectly mapped to, to each other. And as the last thing, this is my last slide, I want to give you a hint of how the the meritocratic principle translates into the context of predictive coding. So in the meritocratic principle, we have we have formulated this as some kind of, of fairness principle, which is compatible with growth maximization. In the context of predictive coding, it's going to be an observation that the, the, the system best adapted to interpret the signals will try to satisfy the base consistency principle as well as possible. So what's the base consistency principle? It says that the average over the posterior beliefs equals the prior belief. Here, it's not going to be satisfied because the system is misspecified. And so if you take these posterior beliefs over the causes given the signals, and you take the empirical average with respect to the true signal distribution, you don't necessarily get back to the prior belief of the system because the system is just wrong on predicting the marginal distribution of the signals. But it turns out that this, the system which maximizes the fit to the data minimizes this wedge between the, uh, the prior belief and the, the empirical mean of the posterior. So it's trying to be as base consistent as possible. And that's the analog of what we have called a meritocratic principle in the other context. With that, I think I, I should be out of time and I'm out of slides anyway, so let me, let me summarize. So what we have done is that we have found an equivalence between two growth processes, economic growth and something which is typically not thought of as a growth process, a process of predictive coding. Uh, and then uh, we arbitraged between those two problems. We it has been understood that the, 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 the solution of the predictive coding satisfies some, some consistency principles and they translate to the economic context and also the economic context with, with the gross interpretation helped us to understand the model of predictive coding, which is a model outside on economics that we have struggled to understand before we have re-proven re, uh, everything ourselves. And uh, we... This, this, this predictive coding takes a, a, a kind of a, what they call a variational approach to Bayesian updating. So you find the, the, the base update, given the model that you have adopted via some optimization process. 
And we have struggled to understand why this works. And it turns out that if once you translate that into, into the growth processes, of uh, uh, then then this might be helpful in understanding uh, those those concepts from from machine learning. Okay, with with that, I think I'm I'm done. Thank thank you very much, Jakub. This was great. Um, so we are moving to the Q and A sessions. We still have about eleven minutes of that. Um, it's our normal process is I'll ask uh, Colin or Yuta if you have any uh, last questions or comments before giving uh, the floor to other um, audience members. Colin, maybe? I mean, I guess I have a general comment that I could make. Um, so yeah, first of all, I mean, I think this is a really interesting project. Um, I like the surprising connection between the growth and the predictive coding. Um, and it seems like a very nice characterization. One thing I feel like I don't understand well enough, uh, and maybe this is my own limitations, is sort of the practical implications of the main characterization. Uh, you know, if I were an applied economist, um, what would I take away from this uh, in terms of, you know, questions like, um, you know, what kinds of features of the setup would push you toward greater equality in the in the growth optimal, um, in the growth optimal policy? You know those kinds of questions um or you know would there be surprising things i think for me having a, a really full-fledged example um including some uncertainty where i could see a bit more of the mechanics of the solution uh, i think would be helpful no thank you thank you so we, we do have a, a slightly more developed example in, in the paper though still it's a mickey mouse example uh i think on a, we, we can relate to a discussion on, 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 on meritocracy. So there is an economic discussion, which is an empirical discussion. And there are kind of three ingredients that, that people willing to redistribute wealth may take into account or into their meritocratic judgment. So some people are just more productive. They have high returns. They are just good at producing. Some people have started with a lot of wealth, so they have produced a lot because they had a good initial condition. And some people are lucky, so, so our performance is, is, is influenced by luck. And there is, a, there is an empirical agreement on that luck is being filtered out from meritocratic judgment. So if you just look at how people redistribute wealth when they observe outcomes, they they, they, they look, would like to filter out wealth and that's uh, uh, randomness. And that makes sense in our context, because if you have been just lucky today, that doesn't predict your productivity tomorrow. It is not in the ID setting. And so if we are redistributing in, in, in with, with the goal to maximize wealth, then I want to filter out the luck. What is more controversial is whether people do filter out those initial conditions or not. And it seems to fair to do it, but there is some empirical claim that people don't. And uh, it happens to be what maximizes the growth rate. And that is the, the consequence of the fact that the, the optimal policy is a fixed point. It is generous to those who perform well under this policy. Right? And it is a fixed point uh, because you can separate the, the, the proof techniques have kind of the, the separated the Kind of the, the merit part of the problem and the, the 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 policy part of the problem, which are kind of entangled, they, they are independent. But then we have characterized the growth rate as an optimization over the both things, as if these things were not entangled. That that might help to explain why uh, the the processes that select societies based on their ability to grow would favor a principle that has this fixed point feature that being generous to those who do well under the allocation induced by the principle. So I think that is our best chance of kind of relating to, to more applied discussions. Um, you have any comments or questions? Yeah, um, I had, yeah, I had a related question, which is, um, yeah, well, I'm wondering, so I, I really like the, the 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 connection to the meritocratic distribution. Uh, it's very nice. Um, and uh, just to you know, kind of 
piggyback off of Colin's question, I think one, one, one comparative static that might be nice, that, that might help would be um, the meritocratic distribution depends on the returns, right? Mm -hmm. So um, can you do some kind of comparative static on, you know, as I change the return matrix, how does the meritocratic distribution change? Um, what are the features of that return matrix that yeah. um, generate more unequal um, meritoc meritocratic distributions? I don't know. Um, that might be mm -hmm. an answer to try to get at, you know, kind of these types of real world um, yes. questions. Thank you. So, so we, we don't do exactly this comparative statics, but in the paper, we allow for an optimization across returns. So obviously, if, if the planner can make returns very, very high in all the states and for all agents, then we have no problem. Uh, but but there might be a ways of, of making calling very productive in some states as opposed to the other state or making calling productive as opposed to me being productive. And... Uh, and an analog of a meritocratic principle applies to this part of an optimization as well. So what we find is that if the if the if the planner can can play around with returns, then also he wants to set up these returns uh, in a way that is kind of as consistent as possible with the outcomes the policy generates. Uh, if, if I could add one thing that's really good for a person's merit is to have a relatively high return in states where others do poorly. Mm -hmm. and so you can have lots of merit and have mediocre returns across the board, but if there's some state where everyone else has abysmal returns, you'll do very well. And that, that is, again, this is, this is an old hedging idea, right? So you would like to have an asset in your portfolio, which might not do very great on typical days, but on a really, on a really bad day, it does at least reasonably well as opposed to all the catastrophic outcomes of other parts of your portfolio. And, and another comment, uh, Jakob talked about the merit principle in terms of distributing wealth. I think it's interesting in the hedging context as well, because you can imagine a portfolio manager being asked how they allocated their assets and pointing to one that had high merit. And someone might respond with, well, it has high merit, not because it has high returns, but because you put a lot of money in it. And, and someone might reasonably say, all you should focus on is the returns. And, and our response then would be, no, no, if you want to maximize your portfolio growth rate, the fact that you dump a lot of money in is right. significant. Yes. So, so perhaps, you know, perhaps uh, less politically, we could have stated the whole paper as a, as a management of portfolio, and we would... One point would be that if you follow some pretty naive and myopic rule, which just tries to, to, to align your investment with, with the historical experience that you have with the, with the, uh, with the assets, then this is going to do well, at least in the stationary world. All right, thank you. Um, maybe you can sneak in another question before we turn the, the recording off. So is he... Is there anyone who'd like to ask uh, a question in the audience? Okay, so maybe uh, let, let me stop here with an official uh, presentation and official event. So thank you, Jakub, for, for a great presentation. Uh, Larry for coming as well, and Yuta and, and, and Colin for paneling. And see you next